Good evening. A special welcome to those who are worshiping here at church and those who are joining us online. This Sunday we will be having our annual examination of our confirmands and we'll be asking them questions that they have learned over the last couple of years and seeing what they know and they're able to confess what they believe. Today we're going to hear about some of those truths that we hold dear and that are essential to our faith. So we ask God to bless our worship today, and we begin with our opening hymn. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, you are the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, for it is evening, and the day is almost done. Let your light scatter the darkness. Let it shine in our hearts and lives. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, and in our deeds, and in all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver and restore us that we may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we have been bought back from sin, death, and hell by the perfect life and innocent death of Jesus Christ. In him we are forgiven. 
Let us rest in his peace until the rising of the sun when we shall serve him in newness of life. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, you form the minds of your faithful people into a single will. Make us love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world, our hearts may ever yearn for the lasting joy of heaven. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We join in reading the psalm of the day, Psalm 67. We will read that together. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the people praise you. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. May your ways be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the people praise you. Then the land will yield its harvest, and God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the people praise you. The first lesson for today is Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 40. As we hear the words kind of from the Ethiopian eunuch, wondering what the scriptures say, so do the people of the world. And that's the blessing that we have, that we are able to speak the truth to others, to explain what God says to us, and the comfort that we receive through Jesus. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, and an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to the chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with the very passage of scripture, and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. And then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azos and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. The second lesson is 1 John verses three, or chapter 3, verses 18 to 24. God has given us the truth. We hold to that truth, and we proclaim that truth. Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This, then, is how we know 
that we believe belong to the truth, and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and receive from him anything we ask, because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commands us. Those who obey his commands live in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand our respect for the gospel. The gospel for today is John chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. As Christians and believers, we are connected to the vine, and we are the branches, and we get our nourishment through our Lord. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We join in confessing our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll start off this way. This sermon is a little bit different than normal. This Sunday we're having an examination of our students. And so we're not going to have necessarily a sermon per se. But we'll kind of answer some questions that you might have about examination. So... You might be wondering, what is examination? What is it? Uh, what do we kind of require here at Calvary when we do an examination? Or maybe you're wondering, what is pastor doing tonight? Uh, but today, we want to kind of discuss, yeah, what is examination? What's kind of the purpose behind it? So on examination day, this Sunday, we're going to have our students sitting here up in front, and I'll be asking them questions. Questions that they have studied in the last couple of weeks. We've been reviewing and they've been memorizing Bible passages, commandments. There's about 170 questions that we have been going through. But we kind of think, okay, well, why do we do this? Well, what's the value of this? And maybe you're starting to think back to your examination day and what you went through. Or, or, or maybe you're thinking about uh, what 
what's going on here at, at Calvary when we do examination. Yet we, we find that it, it's good for these children, these, these young adults, to kind of study God's word in depthly. Maybe you think that's a little intense to ask them all those questions and to have them review it in front of the congregation. Well, but there's a purpose behind all of it. A, it's to help them try to process the material for themselves, to try to, to, try to learn it and make it their own, uh, to kind of dive deep into scripture and to hear what does God teach us? What are those basic truths for our lives? And there's some value behind that. You think about the different challenges that they might face, maybe at high school, college, or life. Maybe you think about the difficulties that could be thrown at them. Or maybe they, they encounter people who question their faith. There's some good value to have some of those answers or at least to know where to look for those answers so that you can respond back and say, this is what scripture says. This is what I believe. And maybe they start to build a relationship with their pastor as well to feel comfortable to come back to him and say, hey, pastor, I have a few questions. And we're more than happy to answer those questions for them. But you also think about the value of the study as well, that, okay, they're really diving into what, you know, who is God? Uh, what has God done? And now that word, the scriptures, are ingraining in their minds and their hearts. And the Holy Spirit is working on their hearts. So, here at Calvary, you, know, you might be wondering, okay, what, what do the kids study? Well, they, they study the, the catechism, Luther's catechism. Uh, we, we have a new catechism that just came out by our synod where they've kind of refreshed it and color-coordinated it, and they have some nice diagrams in it. But it kind of is a book that they've kind of designed to be used throughout a Christian's life to be a reference or maybe you remember the, the blue, light blue one. Maybe you use that one. But uh, there, there's some good resources that are used uh, that uh, help teach uh, these truths. And, and they're very helpful because they, they're geared toward children. And, and sometimes it can even be valuable for adults. But this catechism that we use, uh, it really came from... Martin Luther, and maybe you know him as the, the German monk, the, the, the reformer, somebody who studied scripture for himself and, and went real deep because he wanted to know the truths. He wanted to know what scripture said. People were saying, oh, you can get to heaven by yourself and what you do, and he's realizing, no, that no one can do that. Even scripture says that, that we, we can't earn God's favor on our own. We are dead in sin. But he realized the truth that scripture was revealing to, to us and telling us that we can only gain salvation by faith alone, by scripture alone, by grace alone. And he cherished this message so much that he wanted to share this with other people. It was said that he went to Saxony, uh, an area in Germany where uh, people, Christians were living. And he started to realize the Christians didn't know really anything about their faith. Not hardly any of the basics. And, and even some of the preachers weren't really qualified to teach. And he was really perturbed at this. So he decided, okay, what can I put together so that people could learn God's truth? And that's where the small catechism and the large catechism came in. So that people could study this at home or maybe even at church. And so you might be wondering, okay, well, what is the small catechism? Well, the small catechism is really geared toward those children. It's kind of simple statements with a question and an answer. It, ex 
explains it kind of the point real well and succinct, and it's real easy for children to remember and memorize over and over until it's ingrained in their mind. Maybe you think about the first commandment. You shall have no other gods. And here's Luther's famous words. What does this mean? Uh, we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. So you can kind of see the, the value of having these teaching tools, like a, like a small catechism. And these tools were meant for parents to use in educating their kids, taking care of their spiritual lives. And when the kids got that down, then they could go to the large catechism and start teaching their kids even more. Uh, about those truths that they learned a, a, as a kid, and now uh, they're, they're starting to grow in their faith and their understanding of Scripture. Uh, Luther saw the importance of parents instructing so much that he kind of in, insisted that parents do it, and even fathers. He says, Therefore, it is the duty of every father of a family to question and examine his children, and servants at, at least once a week, and see what they know or are learning from the catechism. And if they do not know the catechism, he should keep them learning it faithfully. What a great idea. To try to educate the children, yes, at church, but also in the home. The parents have a responsibility to care for the physical lives of their children, but also the spiritual lives of their children to make sure that they're growing in their faith, that they're, that they're understanding what their God has done for them. But so often I, I see people who in, come here to church and ask their kid to be baptized. You baptize the kid and you say, hey, now as parents you need to encourage your, your kids to grow up in the faith. You need to bring them to church to hear the word. But then you sadly don't see them ever again. Uh, and sometimes you see this even with confirmation. Kids will go through confirmation, and then once they're done, the parents think, oh, our job is done. There's no more spiritual growth that I have to be responsible for. And so the kids and the parents don't come to church, and then you don't see them year after year, and then the kids might get into the same habit as their parents and say, you know, why do I even need to go. As a Christian family, as a church, we really want to emphasize the importance. Yes, learn God's word here on, on, on Thursday night or Sunday. Uh, come to Sunday school, come to catechism, come to our classes and, and learn what God is saying. And, and maybe we can even think what Proverbs says. Dedicate a child to the way he should go. And even when he becomes old, he will not turn away from it. So our church is currently discussing this family care program that we've been working on for a while and trying to piece together. But a piece of that is kind of growing our church family. Yes, in numbers per se, but also spiritually by feeding the souls of God's people. Making sure that we're faithfully teaching the truth here at church, but also maybe through uh, adult classes, maybe a, a men's Bible study or a women's Bible study or uh, different group studies and things like that. You know, those are things that we are discussing and trying to figure out how do we do this so that God's people continue to grow. Not, not just the kids, but also the adults. And when they're done with catechism, then there's more learning to, to be done. Because we want to hear what God has to tell us. We want to dive deep and find the comforts that Scripture gives us. That we are forgiven. That the Lord loves us throughout our lives, no matter who we are. So, we cherish those truths that Scripture gives us. Okay, we're not going to ask all 170 questions this evening. And I'm not going to put you on the spot to answer them either. But we're going to kind of cover a, a few of them, these truths that, that we cherish. Here, here's the first one. 
We well, want to know uh, who God is. Who is God? How do we know there is a God? So we teach and believe that you, you can know that there is a God by, by two ways. You can know that there's a God by creation, and then you can also know that there is a God by our conscience. And we know that there's a God by creation as we look at his creation and see how marvel it is and all the details and how the, everything works together. Maybe we think of Romans 1 verse 20. His invisible characteristics, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world because they are understood from the things he made. As a result, people are without excuse. So as we see creation, when we look at ourselves and how we're made, we are left in awe. And maybe you go to the doctor and you see how, how, how your body works and functions together. Maybe you go to the eye doctor like me, and they, the lady who was examining my eye, uh, she took some photos and put it on a screen, and she's like, look at this. Oh, look, think of all the cones and rods and the receptors that are in your eye. How, how could this happen by chance? There has to be a God. And I just kind of sat there like, yep, <laughs> you're right. Uh, and I, I even said, I, I'm happy to hear that in my uh, eye doctor, uh, your eye doctor office. And, and so uh, you think about all the people that see all this detail, all the things in creation, and still deny that there is even a higher being that, that is above all the things. And, and what does Scripture say about such a person? Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. So we have creation, and then we have our conscience. And that conscience is, yeah, that little voice inside our head. But how does that say, you know, there's a God? Well, if I, my mom tells me I shouldn't take a cookie from the cookie jar and then I sneak into the kitchen and I take the cookie and eat it, uh, later on, I'm going to feel a little guilty about it. I'm going to feel bad because my mom told me not to do it, but I did. And I shouldn't have done that. And I, I, I have this understanding I should be in trouble. I should be punished. And... and Maybe we can kind of laugh at the cookie thing, but you kind of understand the big scale of it. So when I do something wrong, I understand that I'm accountable to someone. I don't know who that someone is, but I deserve some kind of punishment for the wrong that I had done. So in creation and our conscience, we, we come to the conclusion that, okay, there has to be some higher being out there. We haven't really figured out who that is, though, yet. So how do we know who that true God is? Well, we know who that true God is because of the scriptures. We have the Bible. It tells us who the God is, who created creation. Well, we hear about how he did it. We hear about who he is. And then... With our conscience, we also find out we're accountable to somebody. That I, I, I am not perfect. I am a sinner. And that God demands perfection. And because of that, I deserve death. I deserve eternal death. So, as we read the scriptures, how does it describe our God? Well, a term that we often use is triune. Maybe you've heard of it. And triune is not in the Bible, the word itself. The teaching is. So the, the word it was formulated to make it easy to, easier, at least, to kind of teach the, the truth that is in Scripture. That God is three persons, yet one God. So that's essentially what triune means, three in one. And so if we're doing kind of God's math, you go one plus one plus one, and then you ask, what does that equal? And then people often say three, right? But in God's case, when we're talking about him being triune, one plus one plus one equals still one. 
And, and as human beings, we can't wrap our mind around this, and this is why this is something that we believe and have to trust God. And we have to understand that we are simple creatures of His. We are not God. Our, our man, minds can't com comprehend the fullness of God. He kind of gives us little bits and pieces of Him so that we, we can try to comprehend who He is and how wonderful He is. So when we talk about the Trinity, who, who is that first person? Well, we talk about the Heavenly Father. <coughs> The one who created all things. Not that the others weren't a part of it, but he, he's the one that's attributed for creating the world. And he is our Lord. So then, who, who is the, the second person? Jesus Christ. And so, who, who is Jesus? Well, you could say he's the Son of God. And then we would say that he was also man, right? And so, why was that important, that he was both God and man for you and me? Well, let's maybe take the man one first. You and I are under the law, God's law. A law that he writes on our hearts, and the law that he wrote down on the Ten Commandments and in the scriptures of, you know, this is what you need, you are supposed to do to live a perfect life. But we quickly realize, ah, I can't do that. And because I, I can't live a perfect life, I, I don't deserve eternal life. And so we needed someone, God specifically, to be man, to be one of us, to live under the same law that we live, to live the perfect life that, that we could not. And that's where him being God comes in. Because he was God, he, he, he could live his life perfectly for you and me. He obeyed his Father's will. He, he kept all of God's laws. And he also had to be God to save you from all of your sins. Uh, if he was just a man and lived a perfect life for you, it would just be salvation for him. But because he was God, he could now die for your sin and mine and pay the, the punishment for the entire world to, to save all humankind from the very beginning to the very end. That's why it was important that he be both man and God. So a, a term that we use for God's kind of act of saving us is a word that we call redeem. We often have these kind of big words that we have, and again, it's trying to help us comprehend what scripture says, those truths. Uh, but what, what does redeem mean? It means to buy back. Uh, so how did Jesus buy you and me back? With his innocent life that he willingly put on the cross for you and me, and then he shed his blood so that you could be bought back from Satan, the world, and your sinful nature. And that now you could be one with God and be one of his children now and forever through, through faith. So how, how, how do we know he, he paid for all of our sins? How, how can we really be sure? Well, what does he say on the cross? He says, it is finished. It is all done. I have paid for everything. You don't have to do any more. Uh, I have done it all for you. What reassurance? What comfort? But God gives us more reassurance than, than just, it is finished. What, what, what do we see uh, on that Easter Sunday? We see an empty tomb. A tomb that says, he lives. He has risen. Death does not have a hold on him. Our God is now reigning in heaven. And, it, and we wait for the day when he returns. What comfort. That God lives. We too as Christians will live one day. And then when God returns, our, our bodies will rise again. 
and then our souls and bodies will be re reunited with him. So we, we've talked about the, the first person, the second person, and then who's the third person? The Holy Spirit. So what does the Holy Spirit? Well, he inspired the writers to write the, the words and thoughts uh, uh, on the piece of the paper that we call Scripture. And, but he also plays a role in creating faith in your heart and mind as well. He, he uses the, the, what we call the means of grace. It is the word and the sacraments. Do you remember what the sacraments are? Baptism and the Lord's Supper. And so he uses those things to create faith in our hearts. So you think of a little baby. The, the parents bring the child and the baby is baptized in the water and the word. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now that child is a family member of God. The Holy Spirit has created faith in that little child's heart who, who can't even speak a, a word or even belt, belt out a sound. You know, he, he, here our God is working in, in a child's heart, but it also can work in an adult's heart too. So as an adult listens to God's word, the Holy Spirit is working in their heart. And the Holy Spirit is creating faith in their heart through that word. And through that word, they believe. And so we educate the adult about what we believe and what the Bible teaches, and then we, we baptize them. Or, or maybe they go through a class and they learn what our, our, we teach and the Bible teaches that, that truth, and they join our, our church. So what a, a blessing we have that we have this truth, we, we have these scriptures that, that God has given to us, and we want to uh, certainly encourage the, the children uh, to learn God's word so that they can ingrain it into their minds and their hearts so that, that they, they, when they grow old, they will not turn away from it. That they, they, when life gets tough, they, they know that their Savior died for them and there's something ha that will happen at the end of their life that they'll go to heaven and be with their Savior, that they'll be with other believers. And also, we want to encourage them as they grow. That, okay, just because you're confirmed doesn't mean, okay, we're done. No, we still have a lot of learning to do. Maybe you're thinking about, maybe when was the last time I opened my catechism? Or, or, oh, it was nice hearing some of these questions because I haven't heard them in quite a while. So there's some great value in diving into God's Word and studying it in depthly. And maybe it doesn't have to be over our heads. You know, it can be phrased as a way that a child would learn. Oh, that my God loves me. And that He died for me. And that I have faith because of him. And that is something that we cherish. That's why we hold on to this truth so firmly and we, we take it seriously here, here at our church. That we want to uh, build up people's faith, no matter if they're young or, or old, because we know what the value is. And if we think, oh, we've learned all of it, we haven't. There's always something as I continue to dive into God's word. I, I, I learn something new that I, I hadn't learned before. Or God touches me, my heart in a different way that I needed for that moment. So it, 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 again, it doesn't matter if we've been in the faith for 85 years or 90 years. God's word is still working in you and me. So we say and pray, Lord, Strengthen my faith through your word. Send your Holy Spirit so that I, I look deep in, in, into the, the leaves of the trees that are your scriptures. And that I, I grow to appreciate all the things that you tell me for this life and the life to come. But also give me courage to say those simple truths to my children. 
to my neighbors, to my fellow members, and to my friends, so that they too can believe that truth. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. We'll have a special prayer and then we'll continue with the Lord's Prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have given us your word. A word that tells us who we are as sinners, but a word that says who you are and what you have done for us by sending your one and only Son to die for us sinners so that we could have life eternally. And that our God <laughs> is very complex. That you are our triune Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that you send your Holy Spirit to work faith in our hearts, to strengthen faith, to create faith. Uh, please help us to always hold on to your word. Help us to study your word and to cherish it. But also help us to share it with others so that they too may hear your word and believe it. Amen. And we join to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The mighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and keep you. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with the closing hymn. <coughs>
special welcome to those who are worshiping with us and who have joined us online. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, you'll notice that we have kind of a, a progress for our projects that we announced kind of last week. Um, you see the, the pyramids that we're hoping to purchase in regards to the Easter, uh, or sorry, not Easter, the Christmas end times pyramids. Um, and, and so if you would like to donate to that, you can write on your envelope. But also remember we have the online giving as well that is also available that you can put a line item there and note it, uh, pyramids, and it will also be processed that way as well. Um, if you would like to give your offerings also, um, say for like the summer and stuff, you can also set that up as another option as well. Um, we're also looking for getting an AED to have on, on hand just in case of a medical emergency. Um, we have some people that could be could use that and also there, there's kind of a, a training video as well um, to maybe educate some people on that. Um, we're also looking for some people who are willing to mold the, the church grounds. Um, I put a calendar uh, that you can sign your name on. It, you have it by the month, uh, May, June, July, August, September. Um, we do have the equipment here, uh, that, but we do have some individuals that bring their own uh, riding lawnmower because they, they like the comfort of their own seat and cruising around. Um, so um, if you are such a person, you can also bring your own. Um, we do have gas here, um, and we provide that if, if you would want that as well. Uh, other than that, there's not too many announcements. Um, I, I would like to, a little feedback on how you thought you know, the, the sermon uh, kind of resonates with you in the sense of, do you like it? You know, that kind of format. Um, it was a little bit different. Um, it, it, your feedback I really appreciate just because then I, I can kind of think about in the future, how, how, would this be kind of a, a good option to kind of do things like this from time to time as a kind of a, a refresher of things that maybe we have learned and uh, maybe haven't thought about in a while. So uh, God's blessings on the rest of your week, and we hope to see you next week.